All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about capacitors here. Let's go ahead and just put to put the meter on the capacitor scale. We will measure what we've got and just see see where we stand. So the first thing you always want to do is look at what the rating is. So what's the rating of what you got in your hand? 20 microfarad. 20 microfarads. Now there's a voltage rating on there too. What does it say? 370 or 440. Okay, so a little trick there. The reason why it says 370 or 440. So here's why. Because there used to be 370 or there is 370 volt capacitors out there but that's just the maximum rating that they can handle. So 440 is better, but if people read 370 on it, they'll ask for a 370 volt capacitor to replace it. And so a lot of people didn't know that you could replace a 370 with a 440. So AMRAD and some others started printing 370 or 440 on the capacitors, just so that way everybody knew that it was compatible. But really when you say 440, you're automatically saying 370 or 440. So 20 microfarads is the rating. So go ahead and take the measurement. I'm use the alligator clips, which is nice for this purpose. If it was in a system, you'd make sure to discharge it first, but we are measuring 20.46. So it's well within its rated operation. Now you're gonna notice it's a little bit over. Is that a problem? Is 0.46 no. over a problem? No. no. What does it say the tolerance is? Plus 10 minus five plus 10 or minus five. Okay, so plus 10 would be acceptable, minus five would be acceptable, interesting. And so what that's telling you is right out of the box, that's acceptable. I generally will say plus or minus 10% before I'm gonna measure it, mention it to a customer. And really I'm saying minus 10% because you're almost never gonna see plus 10% like we talked about in our previous video. So let's go ahead and test the other ones real quick and just see where everyone, where all of them stand. Seven and a half. Seven and a half, all right. Plus or minus 6%. Is it connected on there good? 7.6. Yep. Okay, 7.6. All right, so that one is also within range of what it should be. Now this guy here just shows you the inside of a capacitor. We've got our um, basically sheets of mylar or whatever type of plastic that is with metal coatings on both sides. And that storage of energy across that plastic between those two metal halves is what makes a capacitor a capacitor, which is why when a capacitor starts to get weak, what's happening is, is that metal coating is breaking off and flaking off. It's very thin. The reason why modern capacitors fail and the older, one, older ones didn't tend to fail is because they don't have as much foil or as much oil. The foil was thicker and the oil was better. Nowadays, the oil isn't as good and the foil isn't as thick. That's why they don't last as long as they used to. Although I do like the AMRAD capacitors, they do pretty well. But let's take a look at this one here because you can see what it should be. You got 10 microfarads between this red terminal in the center and then all around it shows you what the different ratings should be. But we've got a problem with this one. And what's, what's the problem here? Bloated. It's bloated. So it looks like a toad that set out in the sun too long after he done got deceased. So this capacitor we know is bad. We don't even have to test it, we're going to. What happens is this is a design feature. When it overheats, pressure builds up and the top is designed to displace like that and it disconnects the terminal. So it actually intentionally disconnects so that way it doesn't explode. Because if you've seen some of these come fully apart, they make a giant mess. This oil gets all over everything and is not pleasant. But we're gonna go ahead and test it and see what we get. So we'll do the 20 microfarad. Yep, and then the one in the center. What do we got? We got the dashes of nothingness, which means that we have no microfarads, we have an open circuit, because also this is auto ranging between mi microfarads and ohms, so we have no path whatsoever. Now, some people will teach you on a capacitor to also check from the terminals to ground on the shell. That used to be more of a common problem. Nowadays, these are all plastic lined. You almost never see a capacitor shorted to ground anymore. That used to be a more common problem. So really not a test we do, but if you wanted to, you could take the terminals and measure to ground. So let's just show how you would do that real quick. This is an example. That's it. You just check from the different terminals to ground to make sure that nothing's grounded out. And in that case, if you measured something from a terminal to the casing, that would be a problem, right? Because that would mean that the internal plates or the wires in there somewhere were actually connecting to the metal. Just curious, how long ago did they use those kind of uh, capacitors. So the question is how long ago do they use those kind? You'll still see capacitors from the 90s, um, 80s that are, they're much larger physical size and in some cases they're even going to have a dot which is the side that you need to connect to the common side if it's a single cap. So you'll see some of these where you'll have a dot on one side and that's the side that you're supposed to connect to common and the other side is designated to your Herm 
or whatever start winding you're connecting it to. Modern capacitors don't have that anymore. All right, so let's talk about what a capacitor actually does. What does a run capacitor do? Not talking about a start capacitor. What does it actually do? Stores and discharges energy. Stores and discharges energy, okay. So the, yeah, so the blade or the compressor uh, runs smoothly. So that the, you said so the compressor the runs compressor. smoothly. So that the motor, whatever motor it's connected yeah. to, runs smoothly. Okay, Th those are both true statements. What do we connect the capacitor to? What winding do we connect it to? Start. Connected to the start winding, right? Of whatever motor we're using. So if it's a blower motor, condenser fan motor, compressor, it's always going to the start winding. And if you pay attention to how they're wired, you'll notice that one side of the, the, the start winding part goes into one side of the capacitor, and then the other side goes to the same side that feeds run. So even though it says common, it doesn't get connected to the black side of the contactor, and usually that's the side that we would call common, generally speaking, right? You have the side, that's where you make your measurements on your contactor for your amperage, because that's your common for your windings, but your common for your capacitor connects to the same side that you connect run. But here's what's actually happening inside that capacitor, and it's what Matthew said. You have energy, a field, that's collecting on both sides and then releasing again, collecting and releasing. So again, for every side, so you are seeing one side of this, on the other side of this is another metal coating. And the one side of all of those wraps connects on the bottom, and that's common, and then your other wraps connect on top, which is the other side of that plate. So basically, if you imagine, in fact, they'll call those plates. It's as if you have two plates, but rather than you just having two plates with some plastic in between that are flat, you have two plates with plastic in between that's wrapped over and over and over and over and over again. So the two sides don't touch. That's the point. Just like a transformer, in a transformer, we have our primary and our secondary. These two sets of electrons never touch each other. It's induced through the iron core, the iron laminations here. In the same way, that on your transformer, these two sides don't touch. On your capacitor, the common connections, which connect to one side and each one of these terminals on the outside, or if you're looking at it here, this side and this side, one side connects to the bottom, the other side connects to the top, and you have two completely different um, sides to this plate that's wrapped all around in a circle. Does that make sense? So the electrons never go from this side to this side. A lot of people assume that somehow it's boosting up the voltage it's not. When you measure a higher voltage across that capacitor, what are you actually measuring? Have you ever done this where you go across a capacitor when the system's running and you measure the voltage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still like 300. It's, it's higher. It's not, always, it's not always a set thing, but it's always higher. Do you know why it's higher? Back feeding voltage. Because the motor's a generator. Because the motor's acting as a generator. Exactly. So the motor simultaneously, as it's spinning, that rotor is also inducing additional potential into the stator. So while it's acting as a motor, it's also acting as a generator. That's what we call back EMF, back electromotive force. Back EMF is showing up in our capacitor. And the reason it's showing up is because our capacitor has this separation. So that when it generates on the, on the start winding side, it's actually showing up over here. Now, when it's connecting to alternating current, this capacitor is charging and discharging how many times a second? 50 to 60. 60 times a second in the US, 50 in Europe, right? Depends on the hertz. That's the frequency. So it's charging and discharging that fast all the time. So it's not storing energy for very long, but a capacitor is an energy storage device. And in fact, if you, when you're measuring with your capacitor, how do you imagine that when you put this thing in capacitance scale, how is it measuring the capacitance of that capacitor? JFM. JFM? Yeah. How does that work? Just freaking magic. Just freaking magic. <laughs> I was P PFM. Ron yes. Carey used to always say PFM. Pure freaking magic. The question is, how does it measure it? When you put your meter on the microfarad scale, how does it know what the microfarad of this capacitor is? Well, wouldn't it send a slight charge through it to read the because difference? You said microfarad is a, like a millionth one millionth of a, of a farad. One millionth of a farad, right? Right, and that is a millionth of a Volt or something. Now it's it's a the actual what the definition of a farad I don't remember what it is but it's like a coulomb at one volt or something like that one yeah. coulomb at one volt so or something like that. So it's sensing power. So it's, it's just in a very small. 
amount. It's just looking at because it this this meter knows how much potential it's giving, how much voltage it's giving, and it's a very low voltage. We just measured it, right? And this meter is less than a volt. So it knows how much voltage it's giving. It knows how much pressure it's giving. And it knows how much current it's taking at that pressure. So it can charge and discharge that capacitor and now it sees how much energy. Now again, I'm, I'm acting like I've invented a meter and I know exactly how this does this and I don't. So I'm not, uh, uh, let, me, let me be clear here. But that is how it does it, so you're right? you're actually sending power <clears throat> from the meter to... Correct. So the meter is charging and discharging that capacitor. And then it's looking at how much energy that re was required to do that. That's basically what it's doing. Now, exactly how it's doing it and the math and all that stuff, I don't, I don't know. I just know that is what it's doing. It's literally charging this capacitor. Now, why isn't it dangerous now? Why doesn't it shock me? It's such a low voltage. Because it's a very low voltage. So here's the lesson. The capacitor is only charged to whatever voltage it's given. It cannot boost voltage. It's not a voltage booster. Let's do the experiment. Take our 9-volt battery here. Put this on volts DC. Make sure first that we've got nine volts coming out of it. Yep, 9.6 volts. So we got a good nine volt battery. All right, now take your jumper leads and wire your nine volt battery up to this 20 microfarad capacitor. Don't try this at home, kids. Actually, it's fine if you try this at home. It's not dangerous at all. You guys are afraid of a nine volt battery? Come on, oh, give me a break. It. Give it a second. Go ahead and disconnect your leads off the capacitor. Make sure they don't touch each other. When you're doing so, all right, now measure the voltage on your capacitor. I've actually never done this before, so I'm really hoping that this works properly. Wow. Oh, yeah. Not only does it read 9 volts, it reads exactly what the battery gave it. For once, an experiment went the way I hoped it would go without prior <laughs> testing. It's actually discharging because the meter, even though this is a very low impedance meter, it's actually discharging through the meter itself. Meeting impedance means resistance. So this meter has a resistance and it's literally that, that power is trickling through. If you disconnect it, it'll hold its charge. It'll stop trickling. There's a reason why that same experiment doesn't work as well on alternating current though. So if I were to do that exact same experiment and I was to do it with 120 volts, I were to take that capacitor and wire it up to 120 volts, I wouldn't necessarily get exactly 120 volts on the capacitor. And I want your theories on why that is. Because it's alternating. Okay. So what does that mean? So it's different. Forward, so so it would, it would literally depend on the moment that I disconnected that lead, where it was at. So I could read anything from zero across it, actually above 120, because 120 is called RMS voltage. We actually run higher than that. So when we measure 120 on a meter, your meter is doing a calculation, an RMS calculation, and it's looking at that average. You, you want to do it? You can get shocked pretty good doing this. So let's do it. I don't, uh, well, maybe we'll just shut the camera off before we don't do that <laughs> test. We're absolutely not going to do that test because it's not safe. Wear your masks at home. Bye. Get vaccinated. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.